today is very, very special because we we have the honor of hosting the founder of one of the most successful jujitsu brands in the world. It's really incredible. I started out very humbly selling t-shirts out of the garage at the age of 18 to going out to Cali and now sponsoring some of the most prestigious jiu-jitsu athletes in the world. Um, so I ask you guys to please help me in welcoming the man himself, the man behind Shoyo Roll, uh, Vince Bear Kidwa. Shoyo Roll just kind of started just because like, in, I think right, like in 99, right after I got out of high school, just like any other high school kid and if you have like any type of creativity, um, especially being on Guam, like I really just want to kind of make some type of t-shirt or something that me and my friends could wear. That was really the goal of it. And in the beginning, the name wasn't Shoro, it was like, I think there was like five different names of the company and then we ended up um, sticking with Shoro, it was like Alpha Board Writing Company, uh, Four Branch, um, Vector International. There was like four or five names that I was playing, playing around with in like MS Paint back in the day. And then, for whatever reason, I was doing a lot of jiu-jitsu, I just started. And then, Shoyo Roll was kind of the name that stuck, just because it was the words show your role. Um, and then, that kind of became the name of it. And just like anybody else that kind of graduates from high school, you have a bunch of friends, you know, you go and print 30 t-shirts, you know, you sell two, you give away 28. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, uh, that was kind of like, that was just the life of it, you know, you try and push it as long as you can. I tried to push it as long as I could. Um, but then after a while, you know, your sales either get better, you know, your sales get worse. Um, and then you're just trying to figure out how to keep it alive as long as you can, you know, and hoping that you can sell more, you can kind of hit that next, that next bump that takes you up. So that's, that's kind of like how short it was one, just kind of like me doing jujitsu and then taking those words and kind of making that the name of the company. So. For me, like probably at least for the first six to eight years, it was just kind of like a side hobby thing. It was just kind of like I'll put attention and time to it when I could. I had a day job, I was trying to do whatever I could. Um, but then when I had time, I'd go and try and print some t-shirts. Um, but then it, it came to a point where like I had to like really look at it and say, am I really wasting too much time? You know, my friends would still work because they would support me and represent the brand, but I mean, the amount of time I was trying to put to it and the money I was putting to it, uh, I was starting to get really busy with work. So um, I had to kind of make a, uh, a decision sooner sooner than later. And just luckily enough, I think, once we started to kind of hit a, hit a focal point where we started to really focus on what we wanted to do and what we we're going to do to kind of take the brand in the next direction, um, that's I think the turning point where it kind of kind of helped us focus on who we were and who we were going to be because I think in the very beginning you don't really know what you what you're doing right you just want to do whatever it is that you're inspired by you know so um, there's no true direction to what you want to do you just have all these influences and inspirations and you're just kind of like trying to jumble them all into one idea and that's kind of what we were doing and then probably about eight years into it um, that's when we kind of figured out we need to like really focus on or what we need to focus on as far as like the company and what we're making, what we're doing. So that was like, like 2006, 2008 ish. I think the easiest way to break it down is to break it down in phases. So it's from like 2000, from 99 to 2006, 2007, we we're mainly just printing t shirts. You know? And we we're just a t shirt company. At the end of the day, we we're just making t shirts. And then um, from that phase, um, I think that was just more of a hobby. It was just, um, and we were giving stuff away and we were selling some stuff. And then from 2007, 2006, all the way forward, we kind of started to develop the Jiu Jitsu uniform. And at the time, like um, there was maybe like three or four companies at the, at the most that were trying to do things that were creative. And for us, we didn't, like when the opportunity came to me and they said, hey, do you want to make a Jiu Jitsu? Um, in all honesty, I was like, ah, like I do jujitsu, and it was cool just to like say, okay, we'll make like 30 kimonos or 50 kimonos just so we can put our, our logo on the sleeve. 
so in the very beginning, it wasn't really like, oh, we want to build this kimono company. That wasn't uh, the intention. Um, and then we did the first kimono. Um, there, were, there wasn't really too many things going on, or at least in the industry, too many comparables. It didn't do so well. And then um, they, we tried to do it again on the next batch, and then they asked us. Um, then we really kind of we made a little adjustment, but then it wasn't really that big of an adjustment. So we still didn't really get instruction. Uh, we spent some more money. And then it wasn't until about the third time we uh, did the third kimono is when we, at the time, I just kind of looked at all the best people in the industry and I kind of cherry picked from what I liked from different companies. And then I kind of just created my own personal dream kimono at the time with Key. And, um, and then also just put some inspirations that I like, like some inside Ray Rasa taping because I was into Ray music and like a Ross lying outside. Um, but at that time, nobody was really doing that in that industry. So um, that niche, and that being a very um, traditional, um, strict culture, they don't like to like bend because it's a uniform and it's kind of like a martial art. Um, that along with probably I think it was at that time there was maybe four sizes you could get in the industry with the uniform. Okay, so, um, and then probably within three to four years, we elevated the size chart to about, I want to say about anywhere from like 12 to 14 sizes. So back then, you could, if you did Jiu Jitsu, you could only find four sizes. Uh, but now, the standard in the industry is you have to make a minimum of 12 sizes. So, um, I think those things are kind of the things that help us help us kind of like cement ourselves as far as who we were, where we were, and then what we um, what we started to transition into. And in the very beginning, um, I was very like I didn't know where to go. You know, I was like, okay, I have to put a Guam flag on Guy because I'm from Guam. Okay, I have to put a reggae stripe on Guy all the time because I like reggae. I was like, okay, and I have to um, make this. Um, more clean looking because you know, that's what people in the States want. So I was like always all over the place. Yeah, I wasn't sure what to put, when to put, uh, how. Um, so with time I kind of figured out like, okay, like I'm a, we're a key company, that's what we are. And I think that's the hardest thing is when you're first starting to do things, you don't know really what you're really trying to do. And you're just trying to do the best that you can with the, the resources and the team and everything that you have at the time. So that's kind of at least where or we were in the kind of what we push towards. Every brand has like a life cycle. You know, normally when you start a brand or you start a brand, you have whatever generation it is wearing your product. So um, it could be very popular for one year, for three years, whatever it may be. But then once you kind of become the old guy, which I'm like the old guy. <laughs> You, you kind of lose track of what the new generation wants. You know, they don't want to wear what their uncles are wearing or what their dads are wearing. Um, so for me, um, we just try to really, we try to really focus on trying to do things a specific way and keeping like a really good target in mind how we produce product and where our vision is long term and trying not to trend so that part. I think, um, I think with us, like we try and think like 20 or 30 years ahead saying, we want to try and be somewhat timeless. So if, you know, let's say Pokemon's trending really hard, like and we could probably sell a crap load of Pokemon t-shirts or geese, we would probably steer away from doing that just because we're afraid how that's going to affect us in 30 years or 20 years. Whereas in retrospect, we could have probably made a lot of money selling whatever that trending thing was. Um, so that's one of the things I think that we've done an okay job on is just trying to make sure we get push off long term and hopefully with time on um, young and old they'll still like the brand just because we're not specifically catering towards the old guy or the young guy which is trying to stay in one line which is always consistent.
I think when you first start something, you have a dream to do a collaboration. And then once you do your first collaboration, life is done, you can retire. Yeah. Right? You just want that one anchor collaboration after that, you're like, okay, cool, I made it. <laughs> but I think the, the reality think, of collaborations is, like, in, in, my, in, in my eyes, sometimes if it's not organic, it's kind of like a little bit overrated, you know? Um, so. I think if it's very organic and both sides are working towards something um, naturally, then it's. I think it's it's fine. It's there, there's nothing wrong with it. But for us, um, we've always we were in the same way. We just want to chase collaborations. Oh, it'd be so cool if you do a collaboration with Fruit. Oh, it'd be so cool if you do a collaboration with Undefeated. Blah blah blah. Like all these other companies. Um, and for us, it's normally just through a partnership. Someone would. Um, introduce us, um, hey, would you be interested in doing a project with them? Would you be interested in doing a project with so-and-so? And, -so? and um, what I've learned over time um, is the collaboration should be coming to us, we shouldn't be going to them. And the reason why I say that is because I didn't think, of, I didn't think like that before. Before I used to think like, oh man, it would be so cool if we could do a collaboration with them. Would they be down to do a collaboration with us? So, you know, my idea was like, I should go ask them or hopefully someone could hook us up. Uh, but then looking back at it, it's like, um, if we're doing everything we need to do and we're building our company and we're kind of getting respect for what we do as a company, the collaboration will come. And, uh, and if they don't come, then we're not doing the right things or it's just not the right time. So um, that's how I, um, I personally feel about collaborations and um, and although although Chanel is like, hey, you want to have a meeting and do a collaboration with Chanel? I'm like, yeah, for sure. Where, where do I sign up? Yeah. <laughs> so it's a uh, it goes both ways, but I think for us, we've just been lucky. Um, friends and network and people, um, they've been seeing what we do and they respect it and they're they feel good enough about putting their label next to our label, uh, which we're super honored and humbled by just because um, collaborations nowadays um, we probably turn down probably 80 to 90 percent of collaborations um, so I think the ones we turn down the ones we turn down are really the more important ones than the ones we say yes to you know, so. I just think like um, running a brand and a business it's not for everybody you know so I think um, there's a certain there's a certain love that you have to be okay with if you like something that's consistent and uh, and safe and secure. I don't think running a business um, is really for you. I think uh, running going and working for a company is great. You can turn it off. You can go home. You can go to sleep. And there's like a beauty to that. It's simple. Um, but if you really want to run a business, if you really want to be creative, if you really want to try and create something that's exciting. You almost have to be okay with being uncomfortable. So if, if you're fine with being in a tough spot all the time, you're not sure what tomorrow's gonna hold, um, then it's the right feel for you. <laughs> but uh, but if but it also has the flexibility of becoming something that you may have never thought of in you know ten or twenty years because you chased it really hard. So I don't like to I don't like to promote being an entrepreneur just because I know it's hard as hell. You know, um, if you really want to be at the next level, but if you truly are um, wanting to do something and go after it, um, and you really want to dig in, and I say, and you, I say, go all in and just try and really shoot for it. And all in, not by meaning quit your job because you got to still pay your bills, but I mean, like, you know, if you're working from eight to five, you should be doing your studying from 
6 p.m. or 8 p.m. to 2 p.m. or 2 a.m. So I, that was at least what I did for like five years of like working an 8 to 5 job and then I would stay up and answer emails from like 8 p.m. to like 2 a.m. 3 a.m. and then I would go to like 8 a.m. again for a long period of time until I had to talk to you. You're like public enemy number one. <laughs> it's like you're going against a 200, 300 year old culture that like that's kind of like drinking like a different kind of beer at Hawaii. You know, like <laughs> they look at you like they want to kill you or you just like broke down the cross or something. You know? <laughs> but I mean, I think I think you have to, if you, if you want to take a certain route and you want to be a, a a leader in a specific industry, like you have to be okay with the, like a lonely road. You know, so. You need to be okay with 90% bad feedback or feedback that like they're just not used to. So uh, for us, I think that was once we started to get that feedback, I think it kind of so it kind of let us know that we're going the, in the right direction. Is because most people what we were doing, people didn't understand it. Um, so it gave us an edge. So I think for Guam, that's it's really interesting because culturally we're a very um we're all very simple you know we like to go with the flow of wherever the crowd's going so when there's a guy wearing like dressing super feminine or you know wearing funky clothes like all the boys and everyone's like oh who's that guy so it's a it's very hard to it's very easy to get steered back into that safe zone especially here on island um but relating back to what we were doing with the uniforms back then. Yeah, like everyone was like, look at us like we're crazy. Like, oh man, you could sell so many more. Why don't you guys just resell the same one you just sold? You know, like, that kind of takes away from what it, what it was supposed to be. And then, um, why are you using those colors? Those non traditional colors. Blah, blah, blah. You know, the race is going to be mad at this. Blah, blah, blah. So for us, like, we got all of that bad feedback. But for us, it just kind of let us know that we're going this direction, regardless of what anybody else says um, and I think when we started when we started the company and when we started to really push the geese in like 2008 I want to say there's maybe like I don't know 10 to 15 kimono companies in the in the US and then maybe with the, with, within three to four years there's like over a hundred you know so um, but so it completely changed the industry and stemmed almost a new industry because we were doing business a specific way. Um, we didn't care if we could sell an extra 500, 600 keys. Um, but it also opened up a new market for people. And say, hey, so if these guys don't want to sell these keys, we'll, we'll pop in, we'll sell these to these people. And we were okay with that, you know. Um, but um, yeah, I think I think there's always gonna be critics. I think uh, the more critics you have, I think the uh, that means you're doing a better job. Kind of humbling, you know, because like, um, it, it's it's really really hard to um, to create something like that. And for us, like we like we didn't purposely create that. It kind of just created itself. And so for us, it's just it's nice to be a part of a to to be a, to help create a culture, you know, and that in turn turns into whatever it turns into. So. Uh, I'm just, I just get super stoked that you know, five or ten people geek out on their geek out on their new kimono like they with their new pair of shoes or handbag, you know, and uh, that kind of becomes their thing. And that turns into three or four more people that see that guy. And they all want to be like that one guy. So um, for me, that's it's it's really cool to see a community around the world wanting to do that. Not only with our geese, but any other companies geese as well. Um, from where it used to be. 20 years ago, you know, in an industry, so, um, so that's super cool. As far as like celebrities and stuff, uh, I think it's always really nice and it's really cool whenever someone wants to wear your product and, uh, and they, out of all the companies they could choose, they choose your company that's like super humble, you know, um, but for, for us, it's like, um, we just, we just like, we always just have to keep building, you know, and just as, if we did good this year, you know, next year might, might not be as good. So it's like, uh, we have to always break down what we do and stay, see how we can adjust and change because with the internet, with time, with generations, trends, trends uh, shift so fast. 
And so we just keep on trying to do our best to keep up and have a four vision so more people want to wear this stuff. For me, I think if I could tur turn back and talk to my like 18 year old or 20 year old self, you know, 18 years ago, whatever, I would, I would just say, you know, don't be afraid of focusing on one specific thing and, or one specific craft, you know, and don't get so eluded by uh, the glamour or the, or the sexiness of owning a brand, owning a shop, owning a company, owning this. Like for me, it's just the more someone's able to dive into a specific field and build and create and just really try and geek out and be an enthusiast for a specific thing um, instead of just trying to like become a company so fast, you know, just because that's cooler. I think that's probably the best um, advice I could give, but I think um, if, if it ultimately, if, it ult if your creativity ultimately becomes a company, or it becomes a t-shirt company with time, or it becomes a media company, or whatever it's going to be, um, with time, that's fine. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And if you have funding to do it off the bat, that's great too. But I think um, for me, I didn't have enough um, probably work ethic or information to say, hey, if you really want to be a good creative, you should be studying the top 10 creatives in the world for the next 10 years, and you should you know, my head should be in the books basically just specifically following that field and how to build. I think um, I think that's probably the best advice I can give is if you like something, whether it be photography, graphic design, clothing, fashion, um, architecture, um, or just business, uh, I would just say go crazy with it, you know, like basically live it, live and breathe it for five to six years hard, don't even really worry about trying to make it so much a brand or a company. And then in five to six years, if you're really, really into it, and you have all the education, you have all the information, you did all the research, um, then you know, then I think you, you could really start to give it a run. But um, I think that's what happens is sometimes too early, you try and make it something before you have all the information, you kind of shortcut it. And then you're just trying to put together the pieces after and you have like, it's even worse now because you have the internet. So everyone thinks they know everything, you know, because you just have to Google it real fast without really even doing information, you know. So uh, that's what, that's what I would tell myself if I redid it again, I would say, hey, if you're into photography, like go read like 30 books on the best photographers in the world and see what they're doing, you know. And then think about what hasn't been done locally and then see if it's been done internationally and then see if you can put your spin on it you know i think that's really the i think that's really the biggest uh feedback i can give someone just really 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 study study your craft get good at it and um don't really focus on being so big for guam because that's going to happen already i think really just try and see how you can do it at the highest level and um for people from outside the industry give you some respect as well yeah, because I think some people, you know, myself included, like, you know, once you become like the biggest thing and everyone's showing you love here back home, like you kind of get a little, like, um, you, you kind of lose your focus a little bit, you know, um, you kind of hit your plateau, but if you're shooting really, really high, you know, if you're a photographer, you want to be around, like, the guys like Terry Richardson and Kenneth, Kenneth Capello, and you're doing your photos, and, and these guys are giving you respect because there's some type of originality to what you're doing because you did your research. Uh, I think that goes a long way. Whereas opposed to, you know, the boys in the bill saying, hey, print nice pictures. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that stuff at all. It's just, I know everybody aspires to want to get recognition all the way around, even off the epic.